Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Metro Nashville Public Schools Board of Education board meeting uh, this December 8th, 2020 at 5 o'clock p.m. Dr. Severe, would you mind calling roll to make sure we have a quorum? Dr. Gentry? Aye. Ms. Elrod? Aye. Ms. Masters? Present. Mr. Little? Here. Ms. Bush? Ms. Player Peters? Here. Ms. Poopa Walker? Here. Ms. Tyler? Present. Ms. Bugs? I am present. And Chair, you have quorum. Thank you so much. Now that we've established a quorum, we'll begin our meeting. Um, I'm excited today because we're able to offer, even in this virtual space, uh, the opportunity for public participation. We were really excited and focused on this uh, as a, an initiative to maintain, even during the pandemic. So with that, we have a number of members of our community who are signed up to speak. I'll read the first five names. We have ushers out here ready to present you. We have Ethan Link, Amy Tate, Max Pulley, Christine Pulley, and Heather Powell. You, you will have two minutes. Your two minutes will be logged on the clock. You receive notification of that this morning. Please begin when you like. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Ethan Link. I'm assistant business manager at the Southeast Laborers District Council. We're a, a union that represents construction workers, particularly those that work in concrete, demolition, and civil work. Uh, we also represent the service employees at Vanderbilt University and uh, some of the maintenance workers at VUMC. I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, the important step you all took uh, at the last meeting to thank you all for choosing not to do business with a contractor who um, some of his subcontractors said had not paid them for wages uh, that his workers had worked. Um, our members and organizers have watched as some of the low road practices that we've seen in the commercial space have crept into the pro uh, public space and even MMPS projects like the, like the one we've been talking about. Um, this takes the form of multi-tiered subcontracts that always ends with workers being misclassified as independent contractors. It's a big issue that is made intentionally complicated by the contractors who use it. A uh, chain of subcontracts to make sure you don't know who you really work for, you don't know who really owes you money. I wish I could tell you that the case of Armando Azarte and Orion Builders was unusual, but it was only unusual in one way. And that was that Armando spoke up and didn't back down when he was shortchanged. Um, in 2018, another group of workers who did drywall on the JW Marriott also were not paid. And they stood up for themselves as well and fought for more than a year against an international construction company uh, with the support of several Metro Council members and, a, uh, and organizers, union organizers and lawyers they were able to get their wages recovered without signing any NDA. This won't be enough. We need folks to adopt a policy here that will protect workers going forward. And we stand to uh, uh, speak with you in the future about that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'm the daughter of a Metro school teacher who retired after 35 years. I'm the product of Metro school and the mother of three current students. I have a total of seven close family members who are or were public school teachers. I've served as a room parent for the last nine years and in various PTO positions, including president. Every parent I know appreciates their teachers and is concerned for their safety. Remember, our children are right there with them. In August, we did not know for sure if schools could open safely. Now we know they can. Dr. Fauci says schools are one of the safest places to be and should be open. Dr. Battle says schools are not spreaders. The American Academy of Pediatrics says open schools are a necessity and the head of the CDC agrees. Why don't you? We've seen all the counties around us and all the private schools in this city, at least six I can think of in a 10 mile radius of where I'm standing, hold in-person schools since August. It's taken hard work, there have been quarantines and targeted closures, but the default has always been in-person school and every student has been allowed a choice. Parents should not have to pay $40,000 per year for their childhood to attend in-person school like Mayor Cooper does for his son at MBA. In August, we did not know how detrimental virtual school would be. Now we know. 
Last thing, Metro provided little to no instruction, actively cycled teachers' creativity by not allowing them to teach. This fall, everyone got laptops. And education is more than a square on the screen. Study after study shows that kids do not do well in virtual. 30% of Metro students are doing it right now. Get all kids in school January 7th. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Chairman. This is the board and Dr. Battle. My name is Max Foley and my address is 4604 Medora Avenue. I am a 10 year old fifth grader at Isaac Penn Middle School. During public comment at last month's meeting, I realized that there were two perspectives presented in the comments. So I wanted to come tonight to share mine. Virtual school is hard on kids. It's been difficult to make new friends in this virtual school setting. Usually, I feel like I'm able to make new friends at school easily. Our work is less challenging, more boring, and we can even work at work at it. I feel like I have like eight million links for virtual school. I can't count how many times I've clicked to raise my hand, but when told I've forgotten to unmute. I'm not going to be the teacher because if anything, it's hardest on them. But us kids are struggling to learn in this setting. Also, I started at a new school this year, and it's been hard to fully meet my peers and my teachers. If we were in person, I would know my teachers a lot better and have more friends. In person school is important. Kids need it for valuable social skills as well as entertainment. Many people who work need to care for their children while they run. School is important to everyone. Many people might, might say that in person and computers is the same. It's not the same. My sister was an in person school. You could never know how sad I felt when she had a Thanksgiving party or some other school event. Virtual events aren't nearly as good as in-person events. I would like to be able to go to in-person school, and my friends and I are willing to do anything needed to attend school safely. Science says that schools aren't anywhere near as bad as spreading COVID as bars and restaurants, but bars are open and schools are closed. That is plain unfair, and I hope that you'll help open schools so I can return. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Battle. My name is Christine Pulley, and my address is 4604 Medora Avenue. I'm a longtime advocate for public schools and have three children, Max in fifth grade at Isaac Linton, Nora in second grade at Dan Mills, both of which are zoned schools, and James, who would have attended pre-K at Ross Early Learning Center this year. As the pandemic continues, experts, data, and personal experience tell us time and again that children are suffering. Their learning, social, emotional, and mental well-being, and for some, physical safety are all in jeopardy in the virtual only learning environment. Many parents are faced with difficult and sometimes dangerous decisions about how to care for their children and also keep their jobs. We cannot continue in this way indefinitely when we are still months away from vaccines for adults. While the new COVID risk score offers a helpful visual as to when MMPS may consider in-person instruction, it's important to note that it would not have allowed in-person instruction this past fall. But during the six weeks that this was offered, positive case counts within schools were minimal and far below general community positivity rates, demonstrating that schools have not been spreader sites. I'm deeply concerned that without partnership between MMPS, the mayor's office and the health department, this score is unlikely to yield a return to in-person learning, despite data from schools illustrating we are able to do this well, not easily, but safely. It is my hope that the board and MMPS will enter the coming weeks preparing for an in-person learning option in January. Clearly keeping staff and students safe through quarantines this fall took a toll on schools' abilities to staff their buildings. A collaborative approach between MMPS and the mayor's office to set priorities and solve challenges is needed. Further, the mayor must take action to prioritize school openings by following the lead of other communities who have reinstituted restrictions on certain establishments. And I believe MMPS should openly request this of Mayor Cooper. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. I'm Heather Powell, and I'm the parent of two MMPS students one in first grade and one in fourth grade. First, I wanna make clear that parents support teachers. I wanna give a shout out to Senor Torbert and Senor Stinson. You guys are awesome and we stand with you. 
Some people and groups, I think, are creating a false narrative that somehow desiring a plan to prioritize in-person learning when it is safe to do so means that you can't also value teacher safety. Those two priorities can and do coexist. Teachers are incredible and have gone far above and beyond to make this impossible situation more tenable for students. Second, I want to commend teachers and staff for the incredible efforts they made to mitigate spread of COVID in schools during the brief time that our kids were in person. The results of aggressive quarantining and other protocols put in place produce outcomes that should be modeled by other institutions. I'm here because I believe we can create an environment where in-person learning is safe for those who choose that option. I want to urge you to consider the following. Survey teachers again about their preference to be in-person or virtual. If the most recent district-wide data is months old, it's time to revisit and share unbiased data with the community. Consider revising the metric for in-person learning to include a consideration for school spread, not just community spread. Consider an advisory council to give parents a seat at the table. There are not enough leaders in MMPS or the mayor's office with children in MMPS schools. And the result of that is that parent and student voices are lost in the void. Finally, demand that the mayor's office publicly stand with MMPS to prioritize fostering environment in which kids can learn safely in schools. We all understand there'll be periods of time like this one right now where we have to quarantine or revert to virtual learning, but the ultimate goal should be the prioritization of in-person when it's safe to do so and reverting back to virtual as a fallback, not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, speak to Jane. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Katie Hitt, and I have a first grader and third grader at Julia Green Elementary. I'm here. Uh, I attended public schools growing up with parents who are educators, and I appreciate all the work that goes into education. I'm here tonight to implore you to have a plan for in-person instruction when the second semester begins in January. National should make schools a priority, and they should be the first to open and the last to close. My children were some of the few MMPS students who've had the opportunity to attend in person this fall. The disappointment when I told them they weren't going back in August was awful. But when they got to go back in October, what a difference it made. My girls were counting down until they got to walk into their school to see their classrooms, their teachers, the staff and friends it was good for their souls, not to mention their education. Their lights came on and joy appeared. Those lights were quickly extinguished when we resumed a virtual setting in Jake after Thanksgiving. My girls want to be challenged in person, not bored half the day when their two to three hours of synchronous learning is over. They appreciate the additional help that they receive in person. They are too young to navigate technology issues without becoming completely sidelined for the day. We understand choosing in person option may mean that there are times when a student, teacher, class, or school may need to go virtual temporarily but shutting down the whole system for six weeks without hope that we will resume in January is soul crushing. We need to know what metrics are being used and they should be science-based. The science and data have shown schools are safe. Of the 137 school districts in Tennessee, only nine are virtual only. The overwhelming majority of school districts and students want the opportunity to attend in person. More than half the district wants to be in person. Provide us that option. You have so many people members of this community, businesses, organizations who are ready and willing to help. Tell us what you need. We're all on the same team. Let's get our kids back in school. We have colleges and universities ready to help. Thank you for your time. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Erica Vic Penley and I'm the mother of a sixth grader at JT Moore. I'm here to advocate for my child and all the other students who need to have the option to return to school in January. I speak from experience when I say that virtual school is a poor substitution for a classroom and that our children are paying the price of this pandemic. My once happy, easygoing child with straight A's became a stranger to me as he struggled through a nine month absence from the classroom, teachers and friends. At one point, he was failing every class. He stopped eating and talking to us. His laughter and joy was replaced by depression and isolation. With significant intervention, he's doing better, but he needs to be back in the classroom. That's what the majority of parents want for their kids. Our kids need a solution instead of excuses. Virtual school should never be the default learning environment, and we need to try harder to figure this out as a community because school shouldn't be the first to close and last to open. I urge this body to form a task force on focused on reopening that doesn't just include the voice of the teachers union, 
but also parents, pediatricians, mental health professionals, community leaders, and corporate partners. The willingness to help is there, but no one knows what the specific needs are. And all we hear about is historic underfunding and our children shouldn't be used as pawns in that game right now. We need a data-driven and science-backed plan instead of an inaction driven by fear. You've had nine months as a board to figure this out. We may not have known if schools were safe in March, but we know that they are now. Dr. Fauci says so, the director of the CDC says so, and if it isn't safe for public kids to return to community due to community spread, then why is it safe for private schools? It's just not logical. I've reached out to each member of this board via email and only received one automatic reply. My own school board member, Ms. Pupa Walker, has failed to respond to at least three of my emails. So my next step is the legislature. If you can't come up with a plan and show leadership, I will ask the state to do it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Nick Oh, My name is Cass Benjoff, and I'm the parent of two Percy Priest children. I'm also the PTO president of that school. We all recognize the negative impact of our child's lives being isolated at home, learning in front of a, a computer. My fourth grade son has started the school year remotely, like other children. Within the first two weeks of online learning, five of his best friends withdrew to attend private schools that were open for in-person learning. I started noticing that it was harder and harder for me to get him out of bed in the morning. Two private schools close by hired fourth grade teachers to create classrooms in our school district, which many of the Metro students went to. What started in the spring when COVID took a hold of Nashville and Metro completely shut down all learning with optional lessons to be led at home by parents started to become infinitely more real this fall as the divide between the haves and have nots grew. My son continued to see fewer and fewer of his friends on teams meetings and would come to me daily crying asking why he couldn't go to school with his friends. He started to disconnect. My normally straight A motivated eager child was now not paying attention in class, slumping in his chair, scoring in the 30th percentile on map testing, where in the past he consistently got straight A's and scored in the 80th or 90th percentile. He started to become more defiant, argumentative, and disrespectful. He would get himself so worked up he had trouble breathing and had to lie down in bed to calm himself down. These same interventionists who were asked to help my child are paid for by the PTO at Percy Priest because of $119,000 in budget cuts due to withdrawal. It is bittersweet that Percy Priest can afford to do this where so many other schools families cannot. I recognize that there were already many differences throughout our school district long before COVID came along, but the pandemic is one of the few things in the world that impacts us all. So we as a community and district should do everything we can to navigate it fairly and equitably and not allow it to make the divide along economic lines, which has a domino effect on so many more people. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Huh? My name is Lauren Orser, and I have two kids in the Metro system, a third grader at Granbury and a fifth grader at Oliver. I am also a product of the Metro school system, starting at kindergarten at Norman Binkley. I went to Rose Park, McMurray, then graduated from Overton. I have always been pleased with the Metro public school system until now. I completely understand this is an unprecedented situation we're in, and you're trying to do the best you can given the situation, but it is not working. I feel like we as parents and our children have been unheard, overlooked, and ignored. Especially knowing bars and restaurants are open yet our schools remain closed, it's absolutely infuriating. We navigated through the first few months of virtual school the best we could. It wasn't pleasant or fun by any means, but we did, the be we did what we thought we needed to do in order to get our kids back into school after fall break. My third grader was excited to go back to school and was thriving to be back in the classroom. Now she's once again at home being first back, forced back into virtual school. My fifth grader was excited to start the following week, only to have the rug pulled out from underneath her just a few days prior to going back. She was devastated. I've seen a huge change in her emotional, social, and mental state since the announcement to pause the reopening of middle school. She's 10. This is not okay. No 10 year old or any child for that matter should be experiencing such dramatic and drastic emotional hardships that can easily be avoided. Our kids are failing academically because they are not in schools. They're sad and depressed because they are not in schools. Our kids are suffering because you have chosen to keep them out of schools. At least give us parents the choice or whether to send them or not. My child she said she would be happy to even go to a hybrid schedule just to get inside of the classroom for a few days. They need to be in schools. I've since lost my job because I was unable to go back to work once they paused middle school. 
so I'm unemployed and have a distraught fifth and third grader that are forced to stare at a computer all day long. Please give us the choice to send our kids back to school. It is working in other school districts. COVID-19 is not destroying our children. You are by making these decisions for us. Let us parents choose. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker, Lauren Good afternoon, my name is Lauren Herring. I have a son at Granbury and a daughter at Oliver Middle School. We're a middle class family and I'm able to stay at home with them right now when they are not allowed to go to school. I'm an educator at heart with teaching experience across all school levels. I am keenly aware that my family has almost every privilege afforded to us in this situation, aside from having the disposable income to send my children to private schools, which are in person. Because of my privilege, I'm not worried about the lasting effects of virtual school on my children. Even though my son cries in frustration at his computer every single day, I'm home to encourage him and lift his spirits. I'm not worried that my daughter has never made any real connections with her classmates because I'm able to pay for her to participate in team gymnastics where there has not been a single outbreak of COVID, by the way. I am not concerned that my son misses his classmates because I'm able to host a virtual learning pod where he plays with others his age in a safe environment. I'm not worried that my 10 year old daughter is asynchronous two entire days every week with zero instruction because I can supplement her lessons when she finishes all her assigned work by 10 o'clock in the morning every day. I am concerned about all those children who don't have the privileges I just described. How will they make up a year without writing because it's not happening in the, the virtual setting? How will other children make up a year without touching a musical instrument or engaging in any extracurricular activity? How will other children overcome the desperation, depression, and helplessness they feel as they fail subjects for the first time ever in their school careers because their teachers can't give them support, the support they need through a computer screen and their parents are not at home? Public education is meant to be a great equalizer between the haves and have-nots. The decision to put all students in virtual learning exacerbate, exacerbates this divide instead of closing it. My challenge is the board, to the board is to do whatever it takes to get all students back. Do whatever it takes to make the school environment safe for students and teachers. Do whatever it takes to solve staffing issues. It can be done. My name is Brett Moore, and I have two daughters at Percy Priest Elementary. I'm here to speak about how and why decisions are being made to revert to virtual learning. We've all been told repeatedly that we need to follow the science. The American Pediatric Association, Anthony Fauci, the CDC director, the White House testing czar, all said just this week that the science does not advocate for us to close schools. And this morning, a Brown University published a study that has found little to no evidence that COVID is transferring inside K-12 school buildings. If we're to follow the science, why aren't we listening to the doctors and scientists that specialize in, vir in virology? Dr. Battle, your November 16 email warned that our kids may have to go back to virtual learning. She stated, and I quote, while there are less than 10 school days left between now and the Thanksgiving break, it is still possible that the situation will become so drastically worse that it will be incumbent upon us to immediately revert to all virtual learning. Well, guess what? Two weeks later, the MNPS COVID tracker reported the following. For staff quarantines, down 52%. For staff tested positive, down 17%. For students quarantined, down 49%, and for students testing positive, down 10%. The situation did not get dr drastically worse, it improved. The numbers simply do not support the decision to go virtual. So why do we revert? We should be looking at the school by school MNPS metrics, not metro population metrics. Then we've been told that MNPS is too large, that we can't handle it. Well, guess what? New York just went back this week. They can handle it and they have 1.126 million kids in that. This is ridiculous. We're taking the easy way out and we've got to follow the science and do what the experts say, which is go back to school. In closing, Percy Priest had one positive case out of 325 students in six weeks. And yet you shut our school down. That can't happen. I implore MMPS to get creative, follow the science, follow the school metrics, figure it out. In life, we have choices. We need you to choose to open our schools. Our kids need it for their health and their futures. Hi, 
I'm Jennifer Claxton. I've got a sixth grader at JT Moore and a fourth grader at Glendale who are here today. We chose public despite having the resources to go private. This is the first time in my life I've questioned that decision. Both of my kids are in the gifted program. They've routinely brought home straight A's and the occasional B. My husband and I both work, so our kids are in a pod. We pay a proctor. I upgraded our internet. And despite this, my daughter received a letter of concern for the first time. She also brought home a C and an F on her report card. My son was just placed in tier two literacy intervention. This is the experience of a family with resources and support. It's not at the fault of the teachers. They have been absolutely amazing. Virtual is simply not a substitute for in-person education and not meant to be long-term. Children need visual instruction, social interaction, and less time behind a screen. Our marginalized and ELL families are hurting the most and delay to return has set those children so far behind, I believe that most will take years to catch up. I've talked to MMPS staff who have done home visits and I've personally delivered food at your distribution sites. It's bleak. Public housing with plywood covering window units, inconsistent meals, five to eight kids in an apartment, hotspots that don't work, parents aren't tech savvy, older kids are responsible for getting their younger ones logged on, and there's been an increase in CPS and domestic violence calls. It's a disaster. It's time for all grades to be back in school for those that want it. The in-person election in our elementary school was 80% on the first survey. It's gone up to 85% at this last one. That's clear communication to you that virtual learning is failing our kids. Please follow the advice of the CDC, of Dr. Fauci, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and even our mayor and Dr. Jahangir who have their kids in school. Your concerns and obstacles and issues are valid, but they're similar to other schools around the state and country and world that have dug in, problem solved, developed plans, and opened their doors and navigated through this time. It's your time to do this for Metro National Schools. All grades open January 7th, please. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Jim Claxton. I work uh, for the board. I'm an occupational therapist. I work at three elementary schools and one high school. Uh, I'm just here to, I, for 18 years, I've been an advocate for my parents, and I'm here tonight as an advocate for myself and for my parents. Uh, they struggle with the basic functions, they struggle with food, they struggle with providing a safe place. Uh, logging on is an issue. I, I struggle with it uh, probably other, every other week. Uh, on Sundays, there are huge updates to the system. Uh, a lot of parents don't know that they should have their laptops on. Uh, so when you when you go to log on Monday morning, it takes 20 to 30 minutes for those updates to load. So simple things like this are happening all over the district. And um, I just, I, I love the kids that I work with. I, and that's part of the problem is I miss my kids. My kids miss the instruction that I give them. Um, uh, I see my kids' anxiety go up, and I can only imagine uh, kids who are marginalized, kids who, uh, who don't have the language going on, who, who aren't being pushed, and I, I, I worry about them. Uh, I, I, I applaud all the administrators that I work with. Uh, they put in extra time. I applaud the teachers in the classroom. I'm around kids who can't really wear a mask, and I feel safe. Uh, I've been exposed to numerous kids. I have not been sick, um, uh, and that's just just part of it. So uh, I would challenge you to uh, to come up with a plan. Uh, come up with a plan specific in the elementary age area. Uh, it is a very deadly disease. I, I don't I don't I don't doubt it. My dad had it He's very ill for a long time. He's, He's bounced back, but uh, just think about um, how we can best serve kids in person. Thank you. Thank you. Savannah Williams and Judah Seigan. Judah Seigan. Here, My name is Judah Seigan, and it's been 272 days since I've been in my high school building, the Fog Academic Magnet. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our teachers for supporting us as students in these difficult times. Virtual school has been one of the most stressful experiences of my life. Every day I feel like giving up. I feel isolated, anxious, and unmotivated, and my classmates feel the same way. We started a student coalition to support the return to in-person learning, and I'm here today not just to share my perspective, but others as well. Like the sixth grader in South Nashville who is an only child with a single mom who has to go to work. She does school on her own all day and feels like she's teaching herself. She used to be a straight A student, but this year, she has given up on getting good grades. 
another student, a ninth grader in East Nashville, he hasn't turned his computer on in six weeks. He doesn't care anymore and has decided to drop out. These are just a few examples of kids who are struggling. And at this very moment, volunteers at the Bridge Ministry in downtown Nashville are wrapping Christmas presents for homeless students in our city, kids who are simply not equipped to engage in virtual learning at all. Here are the students. We desperately need in-person learning to return as soon as possible. We understand that it's complicated and hard to navigate. We need you to be the adults and leaders that we can trust with our future. In conclusion, I'd like to quote the CDC director, Dr. Uh, Redfield. We should be making data-driven decisions. Today, there's extensive data to confirm that K through 12 schools can operate with face-to-face -face learning and they can do it safely and responsibly. The truth is for kids K through 12, from our perspective, is to remain in school. It's really important to follow the data, making sure we don't make emotional decisions about what to close and what not to close. The data strongly supports that K through 12 schools are not where we are having our challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Seifor and Sean Demers. Ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Education, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sean Demers. I live at 6018 Ashland Drive in Nashville. I have a second grader at Percy Priest and a fifth grader at JT Moore, and I'm also a graduate of Hillwood High School. I'm here today to ask that the board and director battle begin to prioritize in-person school. Virtual school has been difficult for our family, and I can tell you about the many tears that have been shed in our house this year. But instead of trying to sway you with that, I would like to share some of the concrete proof that in-person school should be Metro's priority. As the previous speaker just said, the director of the CDC recently said, data strongly supports that K through 12 schools are not where we're having our challenges and that the CDC, quote, does not recommend school closures. Dr. Joseph Allen, a professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, said in an interview in October that kids being out of school is, quote, a national emergency and, quote, the consequences are devastating. Two weeks ago, UNICEF released a statement saying that unless the global community urgently changes priorities, the future of an entire generation is at risk. Dr. Emily Oster, a Harvard PhD, who is a public policy expert at Brown University, has studied millions of kids across thousands of school districts and has found that schools are not super spreaders. Dr. Tanya Altman, a spokesperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics and a physician at UCLA Children's Hospital, said just last week, schools are not super spreaders. All schools, public and private, can operate safely in some form or fashion. And in an interview two weeks ago, President-elect Joe Biden even said schools should be open, quote, as rapidly as we can. Based on this overwhelming consensus, I implore you to give serious consideration to giving parents the option to send their kids back to school in person after the holidays. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker, uh, Ann Harris, Vinette and Eno Richardson. My name is Ann Harris Finch and I am a third grader at Joy My teacher is Ms. Fast and she is really amazing. My name is Lily Howell and I am a third grader at Joy Green. I also have Ms. Fast and I think she is great this year. We love being in person way more than virtual school. Virtual school has kept us away from our friends and teachers. I felt like I learned more in person than in a virtual school. And it's also hard to concentrate with the background noise and distractions. Maybe you have a very noisy sibling who is uh, also at your home with you. It is also harder to learn because there is no teacher there to guide you through it. A good example will be writing. It will be very hard to write while the teacher is on the screen. Staring at a screen all day can give you headaches. It's also not the best for you either. We heard people think masks are hard to wear for children, but we think it is totally worth it and we have no problem keeping them on. We hope you send us back to school. It is where we learn best. Thank, thank, thank you, you for, for your time. time. And thank you. Next speaker, Tino uh, Richardson, Melissa Cobb, and Camilla Wilkins. Hello, I'm Anna Richardson. I'm assistant principal for humanities at Liberty Collegiate Academy. Before Liberty, I worked at Overton High School, Apollo Middle School, and now I am in my sixth year as an, edu um, as an educator at Liberty. I've been teaching for 10 years. Throughout my, all, my whole time teaching, I've realized that Nashville is filled with like great educators, teachers, families who really just want what's best for their kids. At Republic, I've been able to really develop as a teacher being able to have some of the highest data for seventh grade literacy, 
and being able to support my teachers now as a leader to really care for performance and person. Our teachers work really hard to build a relationship with families while also providing rigorous curriculum for our students to help them to grow. My ask is that you will consider renewing Republic Charter Schools so that we can continue to give all of Nashville families, students, and teachers great options. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Hickson. Um, Melissa Cobb, Camilla Williams, and Dana Black. Good evening, and thank you so much for your time this afternoon. My name is Melissa Cobb, and I am the Assistant Principal of STEM at Liberty Collegiate Academy. This is my fifth year with Republic Schools and Liberty. I taught eighth grade science for my first three years at Liberty, and so this is my second year as the Assistant Principal. I previously taught in South Carolina with Teach for America and moved to Nashville to teach at Liberty Collegiate Academy. There are two main reasons I came to work at Liberty and Republic. The first reason is that teachers and administrators are 100% focused on student success and achievement. I have seen this countlessly and consistently live through the actions of our teachers. The second main reason is the professional development given to every single staff member in our organization. We strive to push our practice each and every day in order to be the best that we can be for our scholars. These are also the main reasons that I choose to stay at LCA and Republic year after year. We provide scholars with an incredibly rigorous curriculum with scaffolds to ensure that all scholars have access and can really learn and achieve. We also say we never lower the bar for our scholars, and I think a perfect example of that is our adaptation to virtual learning. Our teachers are determined to provide scholars with an excellent education virtually with the same curriculum and new platforms. We have seen growth similar to that of in-person school, and our teachers are thinking outside the box created to creatively differentiate for our scholars. This has resulted in an incredible achievement for our scholars, especially our fifth graders, who have, an who have had an increase of 40% in a pass rates over the last week through differentiating. Throughout my five years of Republic, I have seen our network continue to push and never settle for what we used to do. We revamped our entire math and science curriculum over the last two years to ensure that scholars have the opportunity to engage with science practices and conceptual understandings behind mathematical calculations. I will continue to stay at Liberty and Republic because of our mission. We will continue to push ourselves to be the best that we can be for our scholars and until we are able to reimagine public education in the South. And I hope that you will continue to ensure our schools stay open. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Camilla Williams, Dana Brown, and Alexis Morris. Hello everyone, my name is Camila Williams. I am Kamoya Cox's mother. She attends Nashville Prep. Um, why I'm here today is to explain why I feel like Nashville Prep is a positive school. Um, Kamoya, um, we had originally chose Nashville Prep due to um, moving and it was convenient for us. But not only that, a friend had um, gave us a referral and told us that it was a good program and they had good course material to help Kamoya prepare. So me being a parent I am, I said, well, let me take this opportunity to get involved more and just see exactly what Nashville Prep has to offer. And with that experience, I found that Nashville Prep not only was a positive school, but they all worked together in order to bring about a positive change inside of the student's life. I feel like this school has prepared Kamoya to be successful. And that was my whole reason for putting her in this school is because I wanted my daughter to take a step further for education, you know, um, just with the fact of me being from a family then that, that did not have education. So I wanted my daughter to take it a step further than me and basically be a little bit more prepared. So I feel like with the proper preparation is the key to success. And with that being said, I wanted my daughter to be, um, I wanted her to learn something more and bring about changes in our family and for herself and for others. So when I think about Nashville Prep, I think about the fact that they have a computer science. And I think that computer science is, um, it's an a innovative way for uh, young scholars to learn information. I feel like with technology being the way it is today, it not only gives students information about the coding, but it also can provide careers for their families. And I also want to um, just say that I'm just thankful for having these teachers that um, come along because they basically can help us. And with closing, I want to just say thank you for this opportunity. Hello, my name is Dana Brown and I have two boys, uh, Max Young Worthy, 
who is in the seventh grade and Gary Youngworth, who is in the fifth grade that attends Nashville Prep. They both have ADHD. I have been a member of the Republic uh, School community since 2016 when my oldest boy was in the fifth grade at National Academy of Computer Science. The reason why I love National Prep is because before coming to the school last year, Max Sean was enrolled in two other public schools, um, which he stayed in trouble. I felt his needs was not being met. And um, then I enrolled into National Prep. Um, when I sat down with the team, they got him, uh, we went over his IEP, got him down packed, and now he's blossomed and matured um, than i ever seen before. Um, he's out of trouble, he's not in trouble anymore, and um, so um, he also signed up for the Black uh, History Program, which he'd never done before, and sung with the principal, so I was really excited about that. Um, I'm happy that he's there because um, the teachers keep me in loop, you know. They call me if they're having any difficulties, and I just, they pop right on back um, and get it together. I feel that um, this school should be renewed because these schools have set structures and customized uh, curriculums that help special needs children like mine to see that public schools have yet to offer any of my kids. I'm very proud of National Prep and so happy that my children have the opportunity to remain in a charter school that has molded them to do their best and uh, create a sense of pride and ownership I have never seen in these two boys at any other school they have attended. It's my hope to continue to exercise this choice for my two other children that will be in middle school next year. So, yeah, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alexis Morris. I'm the Dean of Students at Nashville Prep. I've been with Republic for four years. Um, I'm here today to basically go over why I think Nashville Prep or Republic School should remain um, chartered. Republic has shown me that kids deserve access to a quality education. Within my four years here, I've seen students tremendously grow, um, something that I haven't seen when I was in a public school. Um, <clears throat> students have graduated out of their IEPs and grown and reached grade level in both reading and math. And they've also picked up a skill of having computer science as a core subject. I believe that it's important for students to have a quality education and I believe that National Prep and the, the teachers at National Prep provide that for our students. We also have community backing because we provide music for life, extracurricular activities such as sports just like in NPS, but our main component in our school is computer science, which we all know STEM is a growing field in the real world and so it's great, sorry, <clears throat> to have kids being able to access abilities to code and skill. I really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to speak on why I um, love National Prep in the Republic school system, and I hope that we can renew our turn. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Courtney Lewis. Uh, and then Hello, my name is Courtney Lewis, and I am a math teacher with um, a seventh grade math teacher at National Prep. And this is my fifth year with them. I want to talk to you about how my school is like a family. This matters to me. Because, because one of the most important tools of being a successful teacher is having a strong support system behind you. This is exactly what we are at National Prep. From our families having our personal cell phone number so that they can call and text their scholars' teachers, to being able to call my principal on a Sunday night to make sure that my lesson for tomorrow is as strong as it possibly can be. One recent example of that is after the tornadoes back in August, I'm sorry, March, um, while the kids were out of school, the teachers went to the school to be able to make phone calls and to network with families. We wanted to make sure the kids were safe, they had the bare necessities, and then I also was able to drive around and drop off care packages to a family, to our displaced families. We weren't just asking those questions to have information, we were asking those questions so that we can spring into action. You see, we strive to ensure that our scholars have the basic needs so that they can do the heavy, heavy lifting of that academic, rigorous academic work. Speaking of our rigorous academic work, we love our scholars and we want them to be their own definition of success so we can hope, so we hold them to high expectations. We teach them math and lit for 100 minutes a day in addition to their other course courses. We teach them to think critically, research, and make choices for themselves. We teach them the connections between today and their future. We know that being successful starts with thoughtful individuals who have solid care, who have solid characters. We teach them to understand the why behind decisions and then to also ask and respectfully advocate for themselves. 
my followers know that just because I'm big, that doesn't make me the right, the right all the time. And I want to teach them to express themselves and their needs and their desires. And by no means does that mean that they are always right, but that's part of the lesson. So you see at National Prep and Republic Charter Schools, we are reimagining public education, each by ministering to the whole community and preparing their future citizens for success. My name is Todd Cassidy and I'm a part of Let Nashville Parents Choose. While you haven't shared the results of the most recent parent survey, we know that in the last survey, 54% of parents chose in-person learning for their children, which begs the simple question, do you think that those 54% of parents don't want what's best for their kids? Personally, I'm listening to pediatricians, epidemiologists, mental health experts, and even CDC leadership who are all saying that what is best for my children is to be learning in classroom. So that's what I and the majority want for our children. Your metrics and benchmarks have changed multiple times since last summer, so frankly, the credibility of the metrics is shot. Given that, board members, your duty as community representatives is to listen to the majority of parents and figure out how to implement their wishes. That's the job you signed up for. This is not a fiefdom where you can wrap yourself in the flag of keeping people safe and ignore the difficult work that is required in this situation. Yes, COVID has taken a turn for the worse. But like Fran Bush said at the parent rally on Sunday, if Nashville is open for business, schools must be open for business as well. Yes, this is a contentious conversation. As a member of Latin Let Nashville Parents Choose, we never intended or wanted this to be contentious, but because you guys refuse to listen to us, the majority, here we are. And as our message heats up, both within the national community and as a part of the national open schools movement, know that our voices, outreach, and media exposure will just be getting louder. The unfortunate thing that you guys also don't hear from us is this, we are more than willing to help. How do you need help to open all schools by January 7th? We sincerely want to be on the same team with you, but you have to stop operating in a vacuum and you have to be willing to listen to the majority of voices in this conversation. It's what we elected the board members to do, and you must implement the will of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leonard Porter, Lita Salinas, and Sharon Johnson. Great, okay. Um, my name is Lita, and I'm here speaking on behalf of Republic and Natural Prep. Um, I've been with them since my son was in fifth grade. Uh, and before, before, well, when he was in traditional schools, there were so many issues and so many problems. It wasn't until he actually got to Nashville Prep where we figured out that he wasn't on his reading level. So once we actually figured that part out, we were able to me as a parent, the student and the teachers, we all came together to actually get him where he needed to be. I love Nashville Prep, I love Republic because the communication, the structure, um, there is a huge difference in traditional schools and the schools that they attend now. I've sent my eight-year-old to a charter school and he did amazing. And I seen the transition from him being in those schools to um, traditional schools and he was more advanced. Um, I'm a big advocate for education for all children for quality education. Um, not only do I do this in schools, but I've done it outside. I have worked with the proud parents of Natural Propel. Um, so this is not just a thing for me and my children. This is for all children and if there isn't a problem or an issue, don't take it away from them. It's going to be devastating. Um, so them renewing, I'm all for both schools. I've seen not only my son, but other students grow within the after school programs. They celebrate diversity. They celebrate the kids and their um, innovative ideas. Um, thank you. Nothing for your time. Johnson, Zoe Butler, Raquel, Philip Rock. Hi, 
Hey, good afternoon. My name is Latrina Johnson, and I'm the assistant principal of curriculum and instruction at Republic High School. In the past 2.5 years, I've counted myself to be fortunate to be a part of a team that is humble yet hungry to provide the quality of education that all children deserve. My testimony today is for RHS, but from my own moral arc that bends towards justice, a vote to renew RHS is also a step towards leveling the field for educational equity. When the pandemic hit, RHS sprang into action to provide educational and humanitarian lifelines. We knew our families sometimes require us to be more than a school, and as much as we can, we, offer, we answer the call. In the 2019-2020 academic year, over 70% of our students passed the AP Computer Science Principals exam. Our ninth and 10th graders met their MAP college ready growth goals. Our in-house quarterly exams gave us every indication that we would have hit our goals with state, ex with state exams or assessments. 37206, 37228 or 37221, wherever our kids find their point of origin, they need to know that they belong at every seat, every table of power. They deserve to live lives of dignity, integrity, and courage to stand up for what's right. Our kids deserve an education that standards, that provides for them achievement as well as character. As a voter, an educator, and a future parent, I both challenge and implore this board to support the renewal of RHS. We're teaching kids to code, but we're also teaching them to rewrite their future. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Dylan Butler, Raquel Villagrana, Daryl Cunningham. Thank you. My name is Sarah Segan, and I have an 8th and a 10th grader in Metro Schools. I am here today to stand for students who are struggling with virtual learning. I'm fortunate enough to work from home, so I'm able to support my kids with their virtual learning in various ways, which I'm thankful for. But I also am able to see with my own eyes the tremendous challenges that virtual learning presents. Every day I fix technical issues and try to calm emotional and stressed teenagers. And every day I remind my kids that even at their worst, they are blessed to have everything they need and by the grace of God will get through this. Unfortunately, thousands of students in our district are unable to have this kind of support and they can't do a thing about it. Parents have to work, siblings need babysitting, or their housing situation is unstable, sometimes all of the above. We are hearing that 17% of Metro students failed first quarter. And unfortunately, we had to dig for that number because it was not provided by the district or the board to the public, although parents have been asking for weeks. 17% is nearly 15,000 students, some of whom we know personally. As a community, we should find that number unacceptable. For high schoolers who are failing and dropping out, these few months will bear lifelong economic and social consequences, furthering the deep polarization in Nashville between the rich and poor communities. This is tragic. As a community, we were told for months that we would have the choice between virtual and in-person learning, but that choice has not been honored, especially for the oldest kids. If the CDC and Dr. Fauci deem schools as an essential priority, we are confident we can find solutions to open MMPS schools safely and as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa DeBus, Jacqueline Larson, and Zola. It's Jacqueline. Am I ready? You're on. Hey guys, I'm your final speaker tonight. My name is Jacqueline Larson. I think it's fitting that I'm the final speaker because as of September, I'm no longer a Metro Public School parent. My daughter who struggles with an anxiety disorder could not mentally handle the virtual learning option that was provided to her. When we saw signs of severe anxiety and depression in a child nearly eight years old, it rattled us to our core. We made the difficult decision to move our daughter from a public school that we love to a private option. She knew no one hidden behind her mask, yet from day one of in-person learning, she thrived. Before anyone thinks that I hit the easy button and have moved on, you are wrong. My child is okay now, but I am still here and I'm not going anywhere. 
You see, I worry about the learning loss that is happening every single day to those children who cannot learn in a remote setting and the thousands of students who simply no longer show up for school. I worry especially about the mental health of those children, middle and high school students who have not been into a school building with their peers in nine months. And I'm a proud member of two coalitions, Let Nashville Parents Choose and a wonderful group known as Propel. To the board, you have a community of people who are ready to roll up their sleeves, brainstorm, and get to work to help you and our teachers. I encourage you now to create a new and immediate task force to help you execute a safe in-person learning option. We are in crisis mode, and that means we must think outside the box to make something work. I ask that you consider a hybrid approach to the school day, like Sumner County, or that you fast track your substitute application process so teachers can get the help they need to lessen their load. We are the volunteer state, and I'm one of the many ready to serve you. Please talk to me. Let me help. Our children depend on it. Thank you. All right, and that ends public participation for this meeting, December 8th, 2020, at 5 o'clock p.m. We will now move on to governance issues, beginning with our consent agenda. Christian, we can't hear you. All right, and that ends public participation for this December 8th, 2020 at 5 o'clock p.m. We will now move on to governance issues. Are there any amendments to the consent agenda as listed? And though we are in a virtual space, I'm looking at my peers on the computer to see if you all have any questions. If not, do I have a motion to accept the uh, consent agenda as listed? This is Sharon Gentry. I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. This is Jeannie, second. I move to accept the consent agenda as listed. Do I have a second? Second. This is Jeannie. Can you not hear us? Jeannie said second. I'm so sorry about that. All right. It has been moved and properly seconded. Uh, Dr. Severe, would you mind doing a roll call vote? For peace. So I will call the roll, but if Ms. Bobo could confirm the vote for me. All right. Dr. Gentry? Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Elrod? Aye. Elrod votes aye. Ms. Masters? Aye. Ms. Masters votes aye. Mr. Little? Present. Mr. Little passes. Mr. Little passes. Aye. Little votes aye. Ms. Bush? Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Player Peters? Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Poopa Walker? Aye. Ms. Poopa Walker votes aye. Ms. Tyler? Aye. Ms. Tyler votes aye. Chair Lady Bugs. Aye. Ms. Bugs votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Severe. Uh, with the consent agenda completed, we will now move on to any committee reports. We had a few committee meetings beginning at three o'clock this afternoon. We had one which was an executive session. We also had our capital needs request update, as well as um, a budget committee meeting. Mrs. Tyler, or uh, Capital Needs Committee Chair, Abigail Tyler, would you mind offering a recap and a report of the Capital Needs Committee meeting? Sure. Um, so at our Capital Needs Committee meeting, we had Dr. Henson present all of the information about um, this year's Capital Needs request. He went over our top 10 schools that um, are at the top of our, our list. He went over how we got those schools and um, we went over exactly how much each one would cost um, and, and what we're hoping to do at the schools that we're requesting that money for. Um, so we did not take a vote on it yet. That's something that we will be doing in January. So we will continue to have conversations about it if we need to. 
Thank you so much for that update. Um, again, committees are where we, or committees in uh, the MMPS Board of Education are representative of the whole body, meaning that every member, every school board member is part of the committee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tyler and Mrs. Player Peters for su your support and that work on the Capital Needs Committee. Uh, now, Mrs. Player Peters, would you mind offering a committee update from our budget meeting? Uh, yes, we had our first budget and finance committee meeting today. Um, we considered an amendment um, for the current fiscal year budget, budget uh, fiscal year 2020-2021. Um, we transferred $1.4 million from the student-based budgeting to the charter school fund due to um, enrollment changes. Um, and that and these changes were made in the beginning of the academic year um, for the schools and for the student budget to be uh, properly adjusted. Um, there will be probably most likely another budget amendment later on this year as we follow the state uh, form state student um, funding formula, excuse me, um, to make those a correct alignments and adjustments. Um, the motion was made by Dr. Gentry, second by Ms. Tyler. It passed with seven ayes and two were not present for voting. Um, and that's my committee report. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, we'll be looking for more updates in the, in, the, in the winter and spring. Now, if we would allow some time for director's remarks, Dr. Battle, please feel free to, to step in. Thank you and good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, if you could just give us just a moment, we wanna pull up a short PowerPoint. And as you do that, I wanna make sure we thank those who have participated in public participation. We know it is never easy to come before an elected body and advocate. So I appreciate the parents, teachers, and thought partners that always engage us. Please continue to do so. Jamal, um, can you pull up the PowerPoint, please? One second here. All right, greetings again, board members, and thank you for giving me a chance to give you a quick update on some matters that are important to the district. Next slide, please. As you've likely been seeing, and as we predicted, the COVID-19 situation worsened after the Thanksgiving break. With our positivity rate and transmission rates increasing and our seven day average of cases per 100,000 residents still in the high 60s. As a reminder, our schools are part of our community. In terms of the district itself, our report from last week shows 68 confirmed positive staff members, the highest weekly total to date, and 30 confirmed positive students. We've seen far fewer required quarantines or isolations as a result of being all virtual with 130 staff and 115 students quarantined or isolated. Next slide, please. Here you'll see our COVID-19 risk score that shows us at 9.5, the highest it has been to date based on the numbers released this morning. As a reminder, this weighted score is developed using the metrics provided by Metro government each day and includes the seven day positive test rate, the seven day average of new cases per 100,000 residents and the transmission rate of the virus. Our goal is to see these numbers decline to well under seven before start, we start bringing students back into classroom for in-person learning. Because the spread of COVID-19 in our community means spread of the virus among our students and staff, causing possible in-school transmission, large numbers of quarantines, class closures, and sometimes school closures. Next slide, please. Back in September, we asked families to tell us whether their student will be coming to school in person when conditions allow or remain in, the, in virtual learning. Those decisions were set for the remainder of the school year with a promised option to update the decision closer to the end of the first semester if their situations um, or thinking has changed. On November 30th, we opened up this survey, which closed last Friday. In total, 9,408 families submitted answers to the survey. 
While this was optional and only intended for those parents wishing to change their decision, some families use this as an opportunity to reaffirm their previous decisions. So here you'll see the total number of responses along with a table of just those who provided a new decision or responded to the first time to the survey, which was 5,519 responses in total. Of those responses, 57% chose virtual and 43% chose in-person learning as conditions allow for classrooms to be open for students. In total, of all those parents who have responded through this survey in September and December, about 55% chose in-person and 45% virtual. Now in closing, I want to reinforce some of the ongoing updates that we have provided regarding our district response to this uniquely challenging school year. We continue to implement our continuous learning planning that includes our expanded nutrition services to students, deployment of devices and hotspots to all students who need them via our equity matrix at schools, help centers, and through bus routes. We have extended our virtual help centers around the city to support students and families. We've provided new teacher laptops. We have implemented our CLIPS for our exceptional education students to allow for appropriate supports when students are learning in the virtual learning environment. So for example, teletherapy is one of the resources virtual space. We have expanded resources for our English learners, updated supports, provided professional development and trainings to support our instructional implementation and launched our navigator program. We have explored various learning structures, face-to-face, -face, virtual, hybrid, combination of all those, et cetera, and have prioritized the structures that best meet the needs of our students aligned to effectiveness, resources, and feasibility that we have available to us. And we have prioritized our phase-in plan to transition the neediest students back into the face-to-face -face environment as the COVID context has allowed. I would like to extend a thank you to our COVID working groups, our principal advisory council, our teachers cabinet, our staff cabinet, our parent advisory council, and our student ambassadors for your ongoing engagement and feedback to strengthen team MMPS. As I have frequently communicated, we are continuing our planning efforts around our potential phase in during the second semester and will continue to provide updates. Again, these are just a few areas that we have worked towards to support our students. And as a reminder, please wear a mask, social distance, and continue to eliminate convening in large groups. We definitely need your help. And with that, Madam Chair, our Chair, I will now turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you for your remarks, Dr. Battle, and for this information, for this data. Um, we've already had committee reports. Please be looking out for correspondence. We will have a board retreat on, uh, I'm sorry, not a retreat, but a committee meeting in place of what should have been our board retreat this coming Friday. Uh, at, from 10.30 to 12, we'll have a teaching and learning committee meeting. Please feel free to reach out to Chair Tyler if you have any questions or thoughts. With that, it looks like we will move into announcements. I'll begin with those who are in person. So we'll begin with Ms. Bush. No announcements. All right, we will move on to Mr. Little. No announcements on my part. All right, and now we will go in numerical order for those who are virtual. Uh, Dr. Gentry. No, ma'am, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Rachel Ann Elrod. Thank you. Um, I do have one. Dr. Pittman with uh, John Overton High School will be holding two O-Town Hall informational sessions that are gonna be covering expectations for virtual learning in the second semester. The first one will be held on Thursday, so December 10th, and it will be at 5.30 p.m. And the second will be held in Spanish on Monday, December 14th at five o'clock. So Thursday, this Thursday, December 10th at 5.30 or Monday the 14th at five. The information is in the newsletter that is sent out on Mondays. And of course, if you have any questions about that, you're welcome to reach out to uh, Overton or to myself and I will point you in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Elrod. 
All right, we'll move on to uh, Mrs. Jeannie Pupo Walker. Thank you, Chair Bugs. Um, I just want to echo your remarks about um, thanking all the folks that came out for public comment tonight. Um, we hear the passion, we hear the concern, we share all of that. Um, doing our very best to support the district and figure out the best way to get us back in school safely. Um, you know, I, anyway, it's a it's a tough time, and I. Anyway, I, don't, I think everybody can agree this is a really tough season for everybody. Um, I want to personally thank all of the volunteers and all of the folks that have been helping with food distribution this year and with the outdoor help centers. Those are still the volunteer opportunities. So many people have said, how can we help? What can we do? Um, I encourage folks to sign up on the Hands on Nashville website to help distribute food or help with the outdoor help centers where we have folks coming in with IT questions um, and just questions with managing uh, the virtual learning format. I also want to remind folks that we are still hiring and there's a virtual teacher fair on December 4th. We are still hoping to hire folks and um, encourage folks to come out for that. And then the last thing I want to say is that I want to congratulate the group that put together the video and the song We Are Nashville. They were nominated for an Emmy and good work still happening out there um, in our community with our students and I want to give them a big congratulations and I wish uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year to all of our MNPS family. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Poopo Walker. All right, Mrs. Frida Player Peters. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I just want to offer my condolences to the Glencliff High School family. Uh, we lost a student due to a car accident um, and just during holidays, that's a very unfortunate time to lose um, to anyone. So my condolences go out to them. And then um, I hope everyone stays safe with the holidays. Um, as numbers spike up, please wear your mask. Please be mindful um, about isolating quarantine so we can bring our children back to school as soon as possible and lower the spread. And happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Player Peters. Mrs. Masters. Thank you. Um, I just want to, especially since we had so many active and engaged parents um, speaking to the board this evening, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, the Parent Advisory Council is a really great way to get involved and become an advocate for Metro Public Schools. And all you need to do is tell your school's principal that you're interested in being a part of that group. They'll be meeting again in January and um, electing new officers. And these are representatives from every one of our school clusters. And it's just a really great way to have that direct line of communication um, to MMPS administration um, and meet with other parents from other clusters and kind of find out um, what the district looks like outside of, of your part of the world. So I strongly encourage those parents to um, talk with their principals about getting involved with that. Thank you very much, Mrs. Masters and Mrs. Tyler. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of make a little statement quickly. Um, I, we live in a country where business owners and, and their employees cannot afford to shut down and stay home because the government refuses to pass another relief bill. And we live in a state where the governor would rather call in the National Guard to provide aid to our overflowing hospitals and morgues than issue a simple statewide mask mandate. And we live in a city that hasn't fulfilled basic maintenance needs of our schools for so long that our physical school buildings can't meet the current CDC guidelines for air filtration or provide enough space to adequately social distance students. Our city has also grossly underfunded our public school system for so long that our teachers are making less now than they did 10 years ago. And yet everyone is still clambering for them to make up for all the injustices in our society that negatively impact our students. So my point in bringing all this up is to show how connected all of this is. If we really want our kids back in school, I implore you to reach out to the city council, to, your, to the mayor, to our governor, demand that they do their part in keeping our community spread low so that we can open our schools again. Thank you very much, Ms. Tyler. Oh, Abigail. All right. Can you mute yourself? Uh, no, can you mute? It's just an echo. I'm sorry. So we have successfully uh, had a hybrid in-person and virtual 
um, school board meeting. Thank you for those that were in person. Thank you for, to those that were virtual. And again, thank you to those that have uh, engaged in public participation that are making sure that their voices are heard. Um, I'll try to make my comments fairly succinct, but I had the pleasure of speaking with renowned commentator uh, Soledad O'Brien today, and she has been in Nashville for the past few days filming for a new documentary. And I think the one thread that I would pull from my conversation with her is how dismal the conversation around public education can be, especially considering that she was focusing on the 37208 zip code, which is where I grew up, which is where many of our students are still living and um, just don't frankly have the supports in the community that they that they need. And I just would ask that our community continue to wrap our arms around each other. This has been a historic devastating year in many different ways. This has shed a light in others. And so though we can't force the, the end of a pandemic, it unfortunately is a natural thing that, that seems to have to run its course or a vaccine should be uh, developed for it. But there are certainly inequities that we know have been around for a century or more that we've never spoken up about that we've never looked to address. So I will continue to say, I appreciate the passion. Please just keep the same energy. Be passionate when you're not uncomfortable. Be passionate in budget season. Be passionate when the call for equity means that we have to shift dollars from those who have traditionally had more. Um, but the, the conversation about how it seems to be um, a never ending struggle for equity, a never ending struggle for better race relations and a never ending struggle for better supports and wraparound services for students who have you know, historically been disenfranchised. I just ask that we speak up when we see a problem, try to find a solution. The school board is here. Our central office staff is here. Teachers, parents, administrators are here. We just got to continue to have a better uh, collaborative conversation around how to make sure that students get the very best that we have to offer. And there are so many different ways that we can make that happen. So thank you to the many different partners. Thank you for parents. For, thank you parents for all the different ways that you have spoken up, advocated, worked with your children. Thank you so much, teachers, for the for the way that you have not only taught your own children while we've been in the virtual space, but that you've taught other people's children and made them a priority. Thank you to staff, administrators, principals, central office staff for the, the long hours that you've spent doing house calls, that you've spent walking around motels and hotels looking for students that we lost it after the tornado or even during the pandemic or as parents lost their jobs. We know this is not an easy time, especially around the holidays. So I offer, we offer our sincere thoughts and prayers to you all during this holiday season. Please enjoy it as best you can. Be safe, uh, try to be comfortable, and then we'll be ready in January for whatever comes next. But there are certainly, there certainly continue to be plans in place or planning in place. So feel free to reach out to someone that you know that's either in office, i.e. a school board member, your teacher or principal to make sure that your um, suggestions are being weighed in. Uh, uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.